Good morning and good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us today for this LBG and Lighting Masterclass. My name is Arnaud and I'm the representative of Luxury Business Group in France. It's truly an honor to welcome participants today from all corners of the globe. As you watch the video, LBG has been a forerunner in the luxury sector with three core business units, recruitment, talent and consulting that cater to diverse needs of our clientele. Our commitment to excellence and innovation is unwavering and today's masterclass is a testament of that promise. I'm thrilled today to introduce our estimate speaker, Mr. Jean-Noël Capferrer. An authority in the luxury business, Jean-Noël's insights have shaped strategies and directions for brands worldwide. The topic is about to delve into the future of luxury and brand strategies. Couldn't be more timely and essential for all of us in the luxury sector. Without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Jean-Noël Capferre. Thank you very much for uh, welcoming me and giving me the opportunity to meet uh, the LBG uh, friends and uh, partners all around the world. Now, let's move to the presentation. Uh, I have chosen a, a topic which will interest everybody, which is challenges for luxury in the future. Um, now, of course, I will not deal with what will the next quarter of 2023 be for big groups or big brands, because you are already working on this. I will choose the middle term and long term impact uh, on the brands as the core uh, heart of uh, my presentation. And then after this presentation, uh, there will be a lot of questions and answers, and it will be a pleasure to deal with these questions together. Now, let's start with a very basic case. I have chosen here the two most profitable luxury brands in two different sectors. I have chosen Ferrari and I have chosen Hermes, uh, which are both listed companies, listed brands, so the data are public. And uh, it's interesting to see that Ferrari and Hermes within their category, car category on the left and right is uh, leather and fashion, have the highest operating margins, so profitability. And if you look at the last line at the bottom of the topic of the slide, you see that the price earnings ratio, that, that is price of the share divided by the earnings per share, is uh, 49 for Ferrari and 62 for MS, and we, which is far above all competitors. So here are the stars of the stock market. Now, let's start with Ferrari. I have a question for you. The question is the following. Would you invest some of your money, not in buying a Ferrari, but in buying part of the company? A share is worth now 285 euros, more or less today. So the question, in fact, is what is the future of Ferrari in your mind? Do you think you can put some of your savings in this company? And that's the issue. When we talk about the, the future, it means the future for growth and the future for profitability. It's not the future, uh, uh, you know, like a fortune teller. It's very, very basic. And in fact, to answer, you need to answer these seven questions, which are about the future. First one, this is the business of supercars and the supercar fashion show is called Formula One races. So the question is, over the year, Formula One drags the audience of 40 or 445 million viewers. Do you think that in five years this will double, stay or be divided by two? Second question about the future. Each brand is a, a brand of values. So will younger elites, because the rich are younger and younger, the, the elites are younger and younger everywhere in the world, except in Europe, uh, do they still like the F1 values or will these values be totally obsolete? Third question, will Ferrari <coughs> keep its myth, its aura, or become a negative symbol of the yesteryear, which means the old time? Uh, Four question. Ferrari doesn't win anymore the world championship. So the question is, 
can Ferrari stay with his pricing power and desirability if he doesn't win anymore any race? Uh, then another question. Can Ferrari brand stretchers, because they make cars but they also sell a lot of things, compensate eventually for the loss of uh, Aura? Question, would selling more cars dilute the brand? And finally, will electricity change totally the world and there will be new brands, not Ferraris, maybe Tesla, that will take over the profitability and the growth in the electric world. And if you look at the stock market, the stock market is already ex giving answers to these six questions. The stock market is a measure of how they see the future. And the stock market is confident for Ferrari's future growth and profitability. If you look from 2016 to 2023, the market cap has been growing. Now there is a bump because, of course, of the COVID crisis, but now it's up again. So the stock market says, yes, the future is bright for Ferrari, despite the six questions. And the first thing you have, you have to look at is the extreme profitability of Ferrari. And this profitability is due to the fact that they starve the market. They don't produce and sell more than 13,020 to 121 cars per year. So they completely control the volume of production and the volume of sales. Second, they address an audience which is far larger than the number of people who can actually buy a Ferrari. And that's a key notion in luxury, always address to more people than to those who will buy. Because luxury desirability rests on the difference between the number of people who love you and the number of people who can pay. And this is the Abu Dhabi um, theme park extraordinary where most 99% uh, of the people visiting the park will never buy a Ferrari, but they adore the brand. Recently, as you probably know, uh, Ferrari has been making a step from an automobile company to a lifestyle brand. And there is now a fashion show, they are part of a fashion show, and they are selling clothes, but uh, these are not t-shirts at two, uh, you know, at 100 euros, they are really priced like, uh, uh, like luxury. So here is a, a move. Um, and finally, something good about the future. The future is bright if you embrace the future, and the, the future is technology. And recently, I saw uh, in October 16, that was uh, two weeks ago, that Ferrari in the US is now accepting crypto payments. Crypto payment, you can buy your Ferrari with cryptocurrency, which means that the company, the brand is addressing the new world of crypto aristocrats. What is a crypto aristocrat? Is a millionaire in cryptocurrencies. And this means that you have already a step in the future. And not simply saying, oh, we have a big past, we have a big past. They have a big past and they have already a step in the future. Now let's move to Hermes. Same question. Would you invest some of your money in Hermes shares? Now, the share will be a little more costly. It will cost you 1,064, 664 euros. And I have chosen this picture because this is, these are three uh, very famous iconic bags from, um, from Hermes, alligator and crocodile bags at auctions. And they reach prices around 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 euros. So the question is, do you believe Hermes as the future. Now, why do I ask the question? Because the problem is crocodile is key in the mythology of Hermes, and but probably in a few years, no one knows how long. In a few years, it won't be able, we won't be able, and they won't be able to sell crocodile anymore. And this is a typical uh, event and un un unpredictable organized by PETA. PETA is uh, an NGO, people for the ethical treatment of animals, saying, well, whenever you buy a Kelly bag or a, K uh, a Birkin bag, in fact, you are a an accomplice of a murder because you have murdered 
free crocodile to make one bite. So you could say, oh, this is anecdotal. Take care. Before consumers change their mind, NGOs exert a considerable pressure on the EEC authorities, on the state authorities, to change the laws, change the norms, etc. So the question is right, is, is, can be raised. Uh, how long will animals, which, key, which are key in the strategy of Hermes, be allowed to be sold by this remarkable brand? Now, what does the stock market say about this question? Well, the stock market is very confident. And uh, recently, in March 2023, the market capitalization of Hermes, which is a very small company, it makes only $11 billion revenues, and Nike makes $46 billion revenues, where the capitalization, the stock market capitalization of Hermes, now beats Nike. And why does it beat Nike? Because the margins of Nike, operating margins, or EBIT margins in this case, are 14% for Nike. And they move from 28 to 41 for Hermes. Hermes sells more and is more and more and more profitable. So you can say, well, in these two cases, the topic of today is the future impact on, uh, on brands. The stock market, which is the voice of people who buy, not bags, but companies, says we are confident. But at what conditions will it be confident? This is what we will be discussing now from now on. Now, I want to talk about a small paradox. Because the, the Hermes case is funny, is the luxury bag paradox or the lever bags paradox. You know, the quality of Hermes is so high that everyone thinks or believes, and they are right, that they will pass their bag to the future generation. Like Patek who says, well, you pass your Patek watch to the future generation. So it's, this is good for sustainable development because this is the opposite of fast fashion where we throw things away, etc. But luxury companies don't promote it anymore this way. Because if you want to face the enormous fixed cost of stores, of marketing, etc., you need to have consumers come back regularly to the store and buy another bag next season, next year, another season, etc. So it means that the luxury sector will grow by making people buy things they already have. And uh, this is bad for sustainable development. So you see, the issue of sustainability, which is key in the future, is both a good thing for luxury because quality is sustainability. Second, it lasts. It will not be passed to the new generation. It will be stocked in the, in the closet. And something else that may feed the second hand market. And at this time, the luxury brands don't manage the luxury second hand market. You could say, yes, we don't care about uh, crocodiles because there are excellent substitutes now to leather. Not animal leather, but mushroom leather, uh, pineapple leather, latex leather, etc. The problem is, are these substitutes, do they have the quality that luxury needs? And I have chosen uh, something recently that I saw in the press. As you know, Tesla now only sells vegan seats only vegan leather. But the problem is that vegan leather, you don't know how long it lasts. So when you buy luxury, you expect to have a fantastic quality. Sustainability, we don't know. At this time, we don't know if the substitute are, in fact, will be good enough to stay five years, six years, seven years, etc. So you see the issue of sustainability and luxury has good and, and, and bad. Okay, so what did we learn in these two cases? First, that three things will impact the future. Demographic changes, technological changes, and sustainability. Demographic changes. First, as you know, the rich are younger and more feminine. More or less 15% of Porsche buyers are women in Asia. So in fact, it's no more a male world. It's a younger and feminine world. Very important. Second, these people, they care. They are not like boomers. They are not like your buyers of today. They care, they have societal values. Third, they have a high sus sustainability sensitivity. Why? Because 
This is their world now and they will face the climate changes. Very important, the first thing that changes in the future is the customer and we should always think of the customer. Second thing, technological disruption and that creates new entrants, think of Tesla, or new competition. Second, young clients, they don't think tech, they live in it. They don't say tech, you, you say tech when you don't live with it. If you are living with it, you are just living in your smartphone and you exploit it fully. So Meta, NFT, AI, etc. are parts of the world. And finally, this is a source of data and the world of precision marketing has come. That is, you know everything from your buyers, from your clients, etc. And that's a very different world. And finally, sustainability is not an option. Very important. And sustainability means that even if consumers are late, states have now receiving a very high pressure from lobbies and from NGOs. And in Europe, for instance, there are huge, huge changes about transparency, supply chain transparency, eco certificates, eco uh, coefficients, etc. And the world of luxury, not only of luxury, all companies will be submitted to these laws and you cannot say, well, let's wait for the consumer to change. No, 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 you will have to change, especially the luxury world, because, because of its margins, luxury must be a model. So this is what I say, sustainability fosters NGOs activism and they speak loud on social networks and social networks mean reputation. I have found a, an interesting advertising of Porsche and they say soon the new luxury tax will be even applied to necessities like that. You know, probably uh, there won't be a luxury tax, but there can be import taxes uh, on the basis of states saying, well, my consumers don't need really luxuries, so we will increase the tax, for instance, on airlines and also on luxury goods. Now let's move into uh, three different chapters of the topic. Um, what's the impact of the future on what luxury will mean in the future? First, let's define luxury. Luxury is a non-necessity. We don't need it. We don't need to have uh, you know, expensive cars, watches, etc. But because we don't need them, they are very desirable. And because they are non-necessities, we are ready to pay very, very high for things we don't need. So I have three definitions to propose to you, which I think will hold, will become the main definitions of luxury in the future. First, this is the industry that defines excellence. We must think of ourselves as defining excellence. Excellence means quality, beauty, service, experience, creating long-term value. This is not for short term. We are not in the fast fashion business. We are here to create long-term value for the whole supply chain, for the clients, for the producers, for the intermediates, etc. Long-term value. That's our role. Second, we are here to elevate clients. Elevate clients, making them enjoy the high emotions of a superior life. People buy a share of luxury because they think it's a path to a superior life. Even if you have a, you know, a cup of tea in, in Shangri-La Hotel or Mandarin Hotel or Park Hyatt, etc., it's a, a part of a superior life having a cup of tea and then you, you go back home to your ordinary life. And this is why I say the job of luxury is to take people away from ordinary life and dream by many bought by few. Very important, very important. Now, will there be new markets for the sector of luxury? And I think that so far it's mostly materialistic values. So materialistic values are what? Are the belief that if you own something, you get closer to happiness. And if you own the two things, you get still closer to happiness. So it's making a relationship between possessions and happiness. And now we probably enter the world of post-materialist experiences, like the wellness market, not the wealthness market, but wellness, organic foods, directly from the farm, no distributors, outer space travel, 
And I'm working a lot now about cruisers. The, the, the top, top bestseller of cruisers is not Tahiti or Fiji Island, etc. It's going before it's too late, visit the Antarctica. You know, and this is post-materialist world. Now let's hear Tom Ford. Tom Ford has a very interesting answer about what's the impact of the future on the meaning of luxury. He says, let's talk about non-conventional luxury. And he says, time and silence are the most luxurious things today for him. And you don't buy time, you don't buy silence, but yet it's very rare and it's more and more valued. Also something interesting that I found uh, and I want to share with you is that the more we put high-tech, the more we take the risk of losing something essential in life for the luxury market, which is the human relationships. And I found in a newspaper this notion that human contact is not a luxury good. And people, they know they have screens everywhere and they say, give me a human relationship again, please, somewhere. Now let's move ahead and say what's the future of, uh, what's the impact of the future for the luxury sector? You know the Bain data, Bain is a consulting company that does a lot of studies on, not the consumers, on you, that is the companies, and this is the, the, the latest uh, data they publish, which shows you that from 1996, at the bottom left, to till now, there is a constant growth of the personal luxury market. So you could say, okay, we can rest, there is no, no risk, no problem for the future. Take care. Naturally, when there is a war, when there is a crisis, when there is COVID, when there is AIDS, when there is things like uh, uh, inflation, etc., there are bumps. But beyond these bumps, what you see is a constant growth of the luxury market. So it's very interesting to see because there are very few sectors which have had 30 years of constant growth. Why is it so? Well, the answer is terrible. There are more rich in the world. This is called economic growth in the world creates new riches. Everybody focuses on billionaires. We won't be focusing on billionaires here. I'm not talking to Rolls Royce or Bentley. I'm talking to people selling leather goods leather and fashion goods mostly and, and beauty products, etc. Very important. Okay, why is the future bright for you? The future is bright because there will be new first-time buyers. New first-time buyers means that your buyers tomorrow have not bought luxury today and this is why there are queues in front of the mega stores of luxury everywhere. These cues are made by the fact that these people believe that they must buy what is known by everybody. So brand awareness is one of, one of the key criterions of first-time buyers. Without brand awareness, you cannot have first-time buyers because they are conformists. They are quite conformist. Somebody who has already been in the luxury market for years, he doesn't need brand awareness. He likes to discover by himself. So, Marketing spend, marketing investment in brand awareness and image is part of the future and your future is in your hands, it's in the level of investment. Just having a store is not sufficient or being on, online. In the desire, remember luxury is a non-necessity, so desire must be created. Look at the countries, you all know these figures, the future is in Asia. 60% of the customer in the personal luxury goods are in Asia, China, Japan, uh, other Asian. Now, Indonesia will come soon, Vietnam, Cambodia, Singapore, and uh, this is where the new buyers will be. Some billionaires, of course, but new first-time buyers. And don't forget Africa, there is oil in Africa. Oil is not dead, it will be dead in few decades but Nigeria will be also a key country. Second, why sustained growth? Very important. By, by sustained, I mean constant. Huh? It means that there is a new upper middle class. I'm not talking about the high net worth individual. Of course, there are millionaires and billionaires, etc. But there is something important, 
And this is, these are the people who take the plane and to come and on the Champs Elysees and to visit Seoul department store or Japan department store, etc. Is the upper middle class. The upper middle class, they have now spending power. Take care. As soon as there is an economic problem, this upper middle class is fragile. Don't be afraid. You know, you, luxury is a non-necessity. You can postpone purchase and repurchase in one year, in two years. So constant growth doesn't mean there, will, there won't be some bumps in case of crisis where the upper middle class becomes a bit anxious about their future. But what you can postpone, you can buy a bit later. Second, Asia has something that does not exist in Europe. It's called the imperative of success. Imperative of success is something we have a difficulty to imagine in France or in Italy or in Spain, etc. Is you must be successful. And here is a, a very interesting study where consumers are asked, is it important for you to be rich and to look rich? And what do you see there? The country which has the highest score or it's important for us to be rich and to look rich is South Korea. 63% say yes. Then you have China, 50%. Then you have Japan, 43%. And then you have all the Europe. If you look Germany, France, they are very far, very far. So to be rich is glorious doesn't mean they are rich, but it means that looking rich is a fundamental dimension of face saving in Asia. And that's why there, is always, there will be always geographical differences in the marketing of luxuries in Europe. And in Europe, I'm thinking of local buyers versus retail uh, travelers, etc in the States and in Asia. There are three different consumer psychologies. And what does a brand mean when it is known? When it is known, because if it's not known, it doesn't work at all. Luxury brands are international visas of distinction. You, I don't believe in local luxury. If somebody says, I am a Belgium luxury, or I am a, a, an Italian luxury, no, either you are recognized worldly or you are not. And as people travel, they want to be sure they've got the right visa of international distinction. New generation takeover, that's obvious. I won't spend too much time. Now, it's, there used to be Gen X and baby boomers. I'm a baby boomer, as you can see. And now you have got the Y and Z people. And what's interesting is that the Y and Z people, they redefine what is extraordinary. Remember, Luxury is here to sell extraordinary things. Extraordinary for that price. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, uh, far rocketing diamonds at 300 million. No, I'm talking about for that price, that wallet made by a very famous luxury leather brand is remarkable by its handmade, etc., etc. So each generation redefines the symbol of what is extraordinary. And this is no more extraordinary. This is for boomers or for old timers. They, you know, no Y generation or Z would ever have a crush for that kind of exaggeration. So you could say now, how do new generations challenge luxury brands? They are asking six questions. First, we live at the era of self-image marketing. Self-image marketing means what? It means I am a product to be sold to all my friends. And where do I showcase my image? On Instagram, on Weibo, on other types of uh, social media. And the question is, when I show myself with a clothing or a bag or jewels or whatever from a brand, is this creative enough? Because the question is, am I creative enough? You know. So are we creative enough? Ask yourself, are you creative enough? And I, I insist because usually people say, oh, creativity is fashion and luxury is long term. Finished. Luxury is long term plus fashion. Newness factor. Is the brand active on social issues? Very important. Social issues is take positions on, for instance, the Me Too movement. Uh, you cannot just be there and say, I am in the business of things, I sell things, I don't have to tell you what my values are. People want to know if they pay a high price, what are your values to? Are you authentic or greenwashing? Second, do you deliver real services? And now with the data, we are living 
in an era where you have data about not only your customers, but your prospective customers. So normally you should be able, thanks to AI, to define what the anticipation and the services expected are. Finally, is luxury retail a wow experience? Remember, online trade, online commerce is more or less 25 to 30%. So there is still 70% purchased in a store. We must defend this 70%. We must make people happy to come back to stores that still represent 70% of the sales. Now, this is a, a t-shirt. Well, not a t-shirt. This is a clothing from Dior. $860. What? Is there any craft? Not sure. But there are values. We should all be feminist. And that's the new approach to luxury, I'm here not to show myself, but to show the social values I support. And the higher the price, the more it means that I support it. And it's not a Nike t-shirt, it's a Dior t-shirt, and that's all the difference. The price you pay says not only that you have money, but also the values you support. Now, a few uh, data uh, that I want to share with you. For millennials, luxury needs to be fashionable. If you compare on the item, this is the question was, what do you think of when you, when you say luxury? High quality, expensive, prestige, beauty, and fashionable. Now, the young one say fashionable much more than the less young one or the old ones. So fashionability, which used to be very different from luxury, now the new customers expect luxury to be both intemporal and trendy. So the era where you say, oh, I am intemporal and that's fine. And trendy is fashion is finished. We must be both. And that's a real challenge. How to be both intemporal and trendy. Second thing, millennial consider that there is some conflict between luxury and sustainability. They know that 100%, you cannot be 100% sustainable in two years or three years or four years. But if you look at the column on the left, millennials between 18 years old and 30, 34 years old, uh, they have the highest grade for saying there is some contradiction between luxury and, you know, and sustainability. So take care because maybe the boomers and the, the baby, the, the, yes, the baby boomers and the, uh, and the seniors, they don't care very much. The customers coming in the market with money, they will put pressure on you. It doesn't mean that they expect miracles, but we must, greenwashing is finished. Greenwashing is finished. Uh, something interesting is a study I made uh, on when, how do people define luxury? If they define luxury by the price, they, they say 70% contradiction between luxury and sustainability. If they only define luxury by rare, they say, oh, why do you sell rare things? So it's still very, very contradictory with sustainability. The only luxury definition that is not too much contradictory with sustainability is exceptional quality. Because exceptional quality are values people are craving for. And that's the avenue for the future of luxury. Uh, at societal level now, let's think a little about the future. There is a, a friend of mine, Lucas Solka, who's working at Bernstein Analysis. He, he, he wrote a very interesting sentence. He said, the modern luxury industry arouses out a gradual increase of inequality. It's true. Why? There is the luxury sector. Let's not be shameful because there are riches and there are also poor. But we address the riches, the middle class, the upper middle class, etc. Now, the more the luxury sector is growing, the more this will create a problem. Because there used to be a time where, in fact, luxury was limited to a very few number of people, you know. But now we are addressing with 200 or 300 billion dollars or euros for the personal luxury sector, we are addressing a larger and larger number of people. We are not addressing 10,000 or even 100,000. We are addressing 100 millions of people worldwide. So it means tension because this is conspicuous inequality. I have found a fantastic picture, probably in India, of a, two parts of the same town. You've got the slums at the bottom, people who can even, you know, they can only buy fakes. 
And just next, you've got middle class. And this is the world of today, and we have to realize that this is the world on which uh, the luxury sector is thriving. So we must take care of our own image because we make things very, very visible, which are a problem. So this constant luxury growth creates a legitimacy issue. Legitimacy means do you have the right to do it? Not legal right, of course we have the right. But in fact, can you consider that you have the moral right to sell? And the question is, why lead more people to spend on non-necessities? Because if you had adopt the idea that luxury is a non-necessity made desirable, you could ask the question, at the time of change of climate, of change of, you know, uh, values, etc. How can we justify the fact of selling to more and more people buying non-necessities? And the answer is luxury as a category, not as a brand anymore, as a category must in fact care about its own image. And this is already taking part. As you, some of you recognize, this is the Louis Vuitton Foundation. What is Louis Vuitton Foundation? It's a, a remarkable museum that holds pieces of contemporary art that a lot of museums cannot buy anymore. Which means that luxury is moving from the commerce to culture. And probably this is a lesson to, to keep in mind for everybody, is we are part of the living culture. The luxury sector is part of the living culture and not simply a commerce among others. Now I have another question about the future, which I have no answer about. Is how long will last world's fascination for Western luxury brands? Uh, because if you look at the political actuality at the moment we speak, in Middle East, uh, in a, a little everywhere in the world, in Africa, etc., there is a questioning about Western values, Western countries, Western politics. And yet everybody is queuing in front of the stores so the question is, it's, it's, this is very bizarre, this duality between uh, criticism on the political ground and the fact that Western brands are still holding uh, the attraction of the world. Now let's finish with the future impact on the luxury, luxury brands themselves. We saw the future impact on the concept, then on the sector, and now let's talk about the brands themselves. And if we talk about the brand themselves, first thing very important, this is a very high fixed cost business. You know it. Before you have one client entering the store, you need to have the store, you need to have the best place, you need to have the best flagship, you need to have everything, even if there is no consumer coming in. So it is a high fixed cost business. Second, because it's a high fixed cost business, a lot of the brands are becoming part of groups and these groups tend to concentrate themselves. And the groups are listed at the stock exchange. So they must publish every quarter new data about growth of sales and growth of profitability. Okay, which means that in the luxury sector of tomorrow, small is not beautiful anymore. People in the storytelling, they say, we are small, we are small, we are small. In fact, if you want to grow while making money, you cannot be small anymore. You start small, but you don't stay small. And this is a classic figure that, I, that, that you can find on Exxon, BNP, or Bernstein Analysis, or Morgan Stanley. It's a, it's a picture that shows you, horizontally, the revenues per year in billions. And vertically, the level of profitability, the EBIT margin. And what do you see? Small is not beautiful. If you are too small, you cannot face the fixed costs and you don't make money. So, of course, you start small, you are like a baby, and then you grow little by little. But this idea that we should remain small is a problem for profitability and for desirability. Now, how do brands grow at this time, they grow in, during taking three paths. 
The first one is that, of course, everybody likes to have celebrities, billionaires, millionaires, etc. But good, there is also the upper middle class that takes the plane, travels all around and, and queue in front of the flagships. And they are also called the Henry's. Henry's is a very important concept. High earnings, yet not rich. So these are people who don't have a lot of patrimony, but they have revenues. And when there is an economic crisis, the first thing they will be doing, the first thing they will be doing is postpone spending because they are afraid of their future. Second, beyond handcrafted rare products, now the brands sell t-shirts, hoodies, sneakers, because that's the way the young rich dress. So you cannot ask them to wear a tie like me, say, you dress as you want, but wear a, a Dior or a Vuitton or a Prada or a Loro Piana or a Gucci uh, sneaker, because that's the way you want to, to dress, but the, dress it the luxury way. And finally, beyond products, brands sell now experiences, hotels, restaurants, spas, travel, sport, etc. Now, this is an example. To grow brands, extend the frontiers of luxury. This is Dolce Gabbana, uh, 800 euros. Now, you, you can be very creative, but first put 800 euros. So it's how you don't compete with Nike here. You compete with the largest uh, luxury brands. Now, here comes the thorny part, the difficult part. Because luxury is the only sector where growth is a problem. Not because there is no demand but because too much demand creates dilution of brand equity. And your challenge will be to resist demand. Resist demand is the key success factor of Hermes. Resist demand is the key success factor of Ferrari. Resisting demand is a very subtle strategy, as I will show you now in a few slides. The second thing is, the paradox of luxury. In luxury, you sell dreams. Dreams is what people wish to become. They are not that, but they wish to become. They wish to be loved, they wish to be respected, they wish to be uh, uh, admired, etc. The higher the dream, the higher the sales. Great! Now the problem is that the higher the sales, the lower the dream. So success is, and the, the growth of the luxury sector means that brands are successful, how to sell more yet remain desirable? And the answer is by increasing the price. Now, increasing the price is not a, a winner-takes-all strategy. Increasing the price means if you are desirable enough, because if you increase the price and you are not desirable, what happens? People say, oh, it's too, it's too, it doesn't, it's not worth the price. So the issue is that of desirability. And desirability means having two legs. And here is something that is key for the future of luxury. These two legs are these ones. On the left, first, are you sure you are a luxury brand? Defend the luxury status of your brand, and it means activating timeless motivations. What is timeless motivations? Is things that last long term. If you have only this, it's great, you have a great past, you have a great intemporality, but you are not part of today's life. So you must, in the meantime, create excitement for today and capture the evolving tastes of new clients. And you need to do both. A lot of people, if you are too much on the right, you are a fashion house. If you are too much on the left, you are an antique house selling the past, but not the present or the future. So you need to do both. Selection and seduction. Everything on the top, on the top, rarity, exclusivity, past, extreme craftsmanship is about the status, your luxury status. But if you don't have prestige, creativity, inaccessible, etc., you are not capturing the present and etc. So, two tasks now. Defending the exclusive and intemporal status of the brand. This is the big difference between fashion and luxury. In fashion, we love time. In fashion, we love handmade. In fa I'm sorry, in luxury. In luxury, we love time, long time. We love handmade. We love place of origin. 
We love volume under control. We love highly selective retail. We love pricing and we love bespoke services. That's luxury status in temporary. If you don't defend that, you are not a luxury brand and you will not be in a luxury brand in the future. Bespoke services, what does it mean? It means that very important clients and high net worth individuals, they, what do they want? They want to be recognized as such. They want to have a special treatment. And uh, I saw that uh, uh, Louis Vuitton has just created a lounge in Doha airport, restricted entrance. It's not for everybody. If I go there, you know, I have no reason to be let, uh, you know, allowed in it. So it's really with this notion. It's like when you take an airplane, you've got the first class people, business class, eco class, etc. And they don't mix. Don't mix customers between themselves. This is the essence of clienteling. Don't mix. Okay, let's move to the end. And uh, I finish by the second leg. Remember, first leg, defend your luxury status in temporal values. Second, add the cool factor. If you don't have the cool factor, you will not be desirable. And the cool factor is not something you can create for yourself. You cannot say, I'm going to become cool. No, you get the cool factor from the street. So the high street gets the cool factor from Main Street. That's the originality. Cool is borrowed from street artists, street food, street sport, street everything. Let's see examples together. Up. Old example now, the partnership between Supreme and Vuitton is typical. Vuitton was not cool. It became cool because of Supreme, thanks to Supreme. It's the other people that give you their coolness. Uh, another example, Chanel Cool Factor through gaming and tech in Tokyo. Video Arcade in the streets, they add a cool factor to this uh, remarkable, very remarkable brand. Uh, cool Factor invite influencers to play with icons. Influencers are here to play with icons. Uh, you have Pharrell Williams and the beloved Karl Lagerfeld, and they play with the famous tire of Chanel. And this is how you get cool, by playing. Um, another example, Yayoi Kosuma, famous Japanese artist, plays with the icon Veuve Clicquot. You know, this is how you create the cool factor. Up. Uh, another cool factor, Veuve Clicquot mobile pop-up bar. You say, oh, this is very creative. It's, for, it's from the street. You become cool on the street. You don't become cool just by ads or by, you know, by uh, TikTok, etc. But TikTok is very important. Uh, let's move ahead. So what did we learn? And maybe we will uh, end up with this part. To be cool, luxury brands need also to cultivate tensions. In classical marketing, you have to make a choice. Are you exclusive? or inclusive? Are you old or modern? Are you long-term or ephemeral? In luxury, we must provide the best of all worlds. You must be both. So let's see examples. How Carl remained cool? He was the one that destroyed the wall between discount and luxury. And he created ephemeral collaborations with H&M. Not, if it had been long-term collaboration, it destroys the brand. But ephemeral collaboration with discount is cool. Um, another example, Estelle Lauder collaboration with Uber Eats. Another example, Tiffany now adds a touch of inclusive and modernity. Dior, typical extreme luxury pop-up store F full IC pop-up store in a very, very top-notch skiing resort in China. Yes, that's the exclusive part. Yes, but if you wish, you can also have your refinement by buying a cup of chocolate in the new Montaigne uh, Street uh, Dior flagship, and that will cost you 20 euros. And so it's open and close. Classic, modern. Uh, and I want to end up with this recommendation. 
the older the brand, the boldest it needs to be. Because it's very practical when you have a past to believe that because you have a past in luxury world, you can be lazy. And often the past is an occasion to be lazy. Now, the past gives you the status of luxury, but it doesn't give you the edge of desirability. So we need marketing spending, not simply saying, oh, because I am an old luxury brand, I can have uh, uh, this price and this volume. No, 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 no. Be it for today. And I have taken the famous, very famous Dom Perignon brand created in 1693. And Dom Perignon is the name of a priest. It's a religious drink, sacred drink. And yet they passed an agreement with James Bond. And what do you see? You see Dom Perignon uh, j just after or before sex. You don't know. Uh, but in any case, th th this explains part of the coolness of Dom Perignon. It's not a brand that simply rests on its laurel of the past. It says, OK, wh what's the hot thing to be today? In, and they don't have to choose. They do both. And James Bond is very, very past because this is uh, uh, Sean Connery. And I just want to show you if I can, because it doesn't work anymore. The last picture I want to show you, can you move to the next slide, is the very recent uh, partnership between Dom Perignon and very famous today's leading artist. And this is the Rosé 2006 Dom Perignon by Lady Gaga. And uh, uh, there are others over artists, and this is how you, you are both sacred and cool. Another uh, slide, please. And I will finish by this uh, very interesting uh, marketing ID by Veuve Clicquot. Veuve Clicquot is a typical luxury brand worldwide with a positioning feminine. And here is an ID that you can offer a Veuve Clicquot bottle by putting the local address of the destination. So it's both local and global, and uh, you don't have to choose. You are both things. Let's move ahead. Let's finish. Never sacrifice long term for to short, to, to short term. Long term is what we are here to be for. Remember, the role of luxury is to create value long term. Let's uh, make a break at this time and move to the question and answers, if you wish. Well, thank you, Jean-Noël. Uh, thank you for that insightful presentation. Uh, so, yeah. OK. For those who want more, 250 pages. But I made a good summary, I think. Well, thank you, Jean-Noël, and sorry, I forgot you. your famous book, uh, Worldwide. So uh, if you agree, as you said, let's move uh, forward to the Q&A segment. So we have about 20 minutes. We already received several questions from our attendees. And just a, a little explanation. You can directly submit your question on YouTube, and I relay them to Jean-Noël. And now I will also use my mobile phone, as everyone, and. Uh, get the questions for Jean-Noël. So first question Jean-Noël we received from South Korea is about the sustainability and luxury. Mm -hmm. So is sustainability becoming a core value for luxury brands and how are luxury brands addressing environmental and social responsibilities? Uh, everybody, alors, first, if you consider that luxury is redef the constant redefinition of excellence, the notion of excellence incorporates now sustainability. You know, excellence is not something you define for yourself and saying, this is my vision of excellence and I don't care about others' vision of excellence. The world is moving to a point where if you don't have sustainability, you are not even excellent. You have no quality. You, you should not be allowed to sell in stores, online, etc. Second, sustainability is not yes or no. It's an endless process of getting closer to an ideal. We start from very far. If you take, for instance, because most of the processes for manufacturing luxury have been based on a know-how that itself is quite old. 
because we worship heritage. As we worship heritage, we consider that, for instance, the way to make crystal Baccarat. Baccarat crystal for, is very famous, and one of the reasons of this very specific noise of the crystal Baccarat is lead, lead in the glass. Now, everybody, everywhere in the world, people will say, we should get rid of lead, or lead, je sais pas, le plomb. Mm -hmm. All right. And this means changing century-old processes of making the best crystal in the world. And yet, we will have to do it. Same thing for leather. Maybe in 50 years, we'll be using only substitute levers. At this time, we don't know if these levers are good enough for luxury. So we must try to put luxury in the way we work already, in a traditional way, and start changing this way. So this is for the production mode. But sustainability is for the whole supply chain. Because in luxury, we tend to integrate the supply chain upstream and downstream which is very, but if you are working with a lot of licenses, partnership, etc., your job will be to make these partners work in a more sustainable way, which is very complicated because it's different when you do things for yourself and if you do things for yourself, which means that you are able to tell yourself, I have to change my modes of production, now, if you are only working with subcontractants and you ask them to change the way they are working, you need to be a big, big, big client to make them change. If you are a small client, they will not change just for your eyes. So, they're making the whole supply chain evolve towards um, uh, sustainability is a challenge that will take time. So, what is expected from luxury brands is that they demonstrate finish with greenwashing, that they demonstrate that they have engaged a process of changing the whole supply chain little by little with an ideal is... Well. And this ideal is pushed by the local authorities. The local authorities in Europe, for instance in France, there are new laws now pushed by Kering and all other actors of the luxury, uh, personal luxury sector to, sup to suppress waste destruction over inventory destruction. You know, you, the problem of luxury, as also of fashion, is the coincidence between demand and supply. And sometimes uh, you have produced so much that in fact you have still a lot of products left at the end of the year or left at, at the end of the season. So you can... There used to be strategies of destruction and this is not allowed anymore. There is a second-hand market. There are other routes to keep the product but not to destroy them anymore. So there is something very important I want to stress again. In all parts of the world, with different speeds, authorities are taking laws, norms. Norms is something that applies to everybody that you are not allowed to sell if you don't comply with the norms, which will push a lot of transparency from the brands. And this transparency means that in the annual report, every year, there are a lot of data on finance. And now there will be a lot of data on progress in sustainability. This exists for many years. It will be now an obligation. Well, thank you, Jean-Noël. Very, very clear. Uh, I had another question from uh, Saul, which is uh, even for myself very interesting, I guess. It's about the, the Korean influencing today and how Korea influencing the luxury industry. Uh, and how do Korean fashion, culture, K-beauty, etc. had an impact on the luxury trends? First, Korea has an enormous impact on Asia. Because, because Korea is... It's very interesting. It's like influentials, you know. We are all taking, you know, speaking about influentials and how influentials have changed the world. Uh, the world of fashion, for instance. What is an influential? Is a person like you and me, except that he's not like you and me. And instead of having a lot of new buyers, remember, the growth of the luxury business will be based on first buyers. 
millions of first buyers. These first buyers, they know nothing about luxury. Their parents were eating rice. And now they have money. And why should they believe brands they have no idea about? Western brands. So they need middle persons with a lot of reputation close to them. And this is why influencers are becoming a key marketing, a necessary marketing input in any marketing plan. Okay, I need somebody like me who tells me what to do because I know nothing. Now, of course, millionaires, they don't care about influencers. All right? So what's the relationship with Korea? Korea is acting as an influential vis-a-vis -vis China. Because Korea is both a very Asian country, and whenever I go to a, a Korea, I love it because I feel at home. And in the meantime, it's a country that has incorporated a lot of Occidental codes. So it's an interesting mix of first Asia and the West. And then, instead of trying to, to sell to the West, they, they are considered as the, the people to be followed to know what to buy. Second point, what is new? This is a classical influential thing. What is new is that Korea had had a strategy, a state strategy, to create the new influentials in terms of music for the world. So it's no more looking at Asia, it's for the world. And all the K-pop, etc. is not... You, you see, it's very interesting. At this time, the Rolling Stones are publishing their latest record. The Rolling Stones is a rock group, 60 years old rock group. At that time, the rock groups, the Beatles, the Stones, etc., they came out alone from in different bars or discotheques, etc., and they managed to make their way alone. This is why it took so long. Now, in Korea, because Korea is a very modern country, they decided to create from scratch the K-pop groups and to create the music that will, that, they, they, that will influence the world, not only Asia. So, it's very interesting to see how Korea is impacting the pop culture of the world. And because luxury needs coolness, luxury needs to flirt with this pop culture. Flirt only, no more. Because no more, more is fashion. And luxury is always at the verge of fashion. Thank you, Jean-Noël. I had a third question to ask you from China about the personalization and customization. So how is the importance of personalized customization? Sorry, I lost my, my question. So again, how is the importance of personalized experiences and customization reflected in the luxury sector? Thank you very much. Well, the highest, the spending power of your client, the more he doesn't want to buy the same thing as others. So here we come, we address the consequence of success. The consequence of success is that you will have to manage three types of clients. Your fans. Second, uh, the fans are the believers, those who believe in your brand, they, they, they only think of you, they, 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 they dream of you every night, etc. But the people who are queuing are also sometimes people who think you, they should buy your brand among others. We call them the butterflies. They move from one brand to another. They are not fans. Mm. And uh, then you have another group of people who will buy something very original from you, but they will never be faithful, and because they are a little, they think of themselves as uh, explorers, uh, in any case, don't expect loyalty from them. So here is already a, a first problem, because of the growth of the clientele, we have to think, how can I treat differently these people, because fans want to be treated as fans, and they don't want to be treated as wannabes, or as butterflies, etc. And within the fans, you have two types of people. You have the people who are the old timers, and for them, they are the brand, and you should respect them, and they like the past. And 
on the other side of the fans are the fans of what you are becoming and the newest part of what you are. And it's very difficult, you know, if you are Burberry, for instance, to talk to the old timers who say, oh, let's talk about the old Burberry and I want the trench coat, etc. And the new ones who want things very electric, very modern, very, very trendy, etc. So there is a portfolio clientele management issue. Still in this portfolio management issue, there is the idea that there are some people very rich. Remember, in the luxury sector, 1% of the people represent 12% of the sales. 3% of the people represent 30% of the sales. And the first time buyers, they are 48%, they represent 12% of the sales. So let's not put our money on the wrong place. We need first time buyers. We need to open a little the door. Uh, so we need non-expensive items. It doesn't mean, we'll talk about this later, we need non-expensive bags if you are Hermes. It means you can have fragrance or belts. But it means that personalization is a sine qua non of people with a lot of spending power. They don't come here to have the same thing as everybody else. Remember, luxury is dreamed by everybody, not bought by everybody. So they want to have bespoke, bespoke, bespoke. They are ready to wait. They can wait. They can wait one week, two weeks. Ferrari makes their money not by buying ready-made cars, but the most expensive cars where everything is an option. No, there are no two identical Ferraris in the world. Everything is optional. It's like in the airplane, first class, business class, economy class. They all go to Las Vegas or they all go to Paris, Shanghai, Paris. But you don't have the same treatment. You don't have the same food. You don't have the same service. The higher the clientele, the more you should be bespoke. Thank you, Jean-Noël, thank you. Last question, uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, this is a very interesting one. So, when considering starting a new luxury brand, what's the most crucial element? And our audience adding something, I'm keen to understand what could make us competitive against the heritage or other renewed luxury brands. Benchmark Richard Mille. Answer. Now I'm going to give more flesh to my answer. Richard Mill is the name of a man. It is also the name of a brand, which is somehow 20 years old, that has totally changed the high jewelry, a high watch, the high, highly expensive watch market. It's a man which, who had been working all his life in the classical brands, you know where people are very, very prone to say that they reproduce the past and they reproduce the past and they reproduce the past, etc. And he said, I want to make my own brand of watches, but I don't care about the past because there are too many brands selling the past. So he decided to create his own brand selling only the future. And Richard Mill was the first brand to have only materials, ingredients, that are used to send rockets to the moon. That is the most solid and the lightest on Earth. Not gold, not silver, not diamond, not, not, not all these. So when you took your first Richard Mille watch, you had the feeling it was a watch for kids. You say, what is this? It's very light. It's, it, it's, for, it's for fun. What is this? I want a, you know, real watch must be heavy, look heavy, look expensive, etc. Now, if you put the materials that are used to send rockets to the moon, you must be the most solid on Earth and the lightest, otherwise you cannot reach the moon. Second, limited editions, only limited editions. Third, very solid. Have you noticed that Mr. Federer, who is the ambassador of Rolex, doesn't play tennis with a Rolex? 
because the shocks are too big. The shocks are too strong. Now, Nadal plays with his Richard Mill. The Richard Mill are made in a such a way that they are solid, remarkably solid, and you can be Felipe Massa and drive Formula One with your watch, be Nadal and play Wimbledon with your watch. Now, what's the consequence? There is no, the first Richard Mill watch was sold 300,000 euros per piece. At that time, everybody thought these prices would be impossible. So why were they sold 300,000 euros per piece? Not just for show off. Hmm. Nobody can sh be show off with an unknown name, Richard Mill. But everybody wants to have a Formula One on their wrist that lasts and which has the technicity of a Formula One car. And it was 300,000 euros because Richard Mill wanted to be profitable starting year one. Most people say in luxury you are profitable after 10 years. That's what big groups tell you. He said, I cannot wait 10 years. I don't have much money. So he said, if I want to be profitable starting year one, I will sell 20 watches and I cannot do more than 20 watches made in Switzerland at 300,000 and he was profitable from the start by selling the future. Now, if you look at Tesla, Tesla could have remained a luxury brand. Now, because they want to compete against Toyota, they will not remain luxury. They will not remain on the top of the pyramid. They will have cars which are more and more accessible. They want to be a big guy in the fight against electrical new Chinese brand. But if they had stayed at the level of Tesla Model S, they could have been the new Ferrari. So the future is open, but you must be obsessed by three things. First, quality. Second, think not models for everybody, but selling on options like Ferrari. Everything is optional. Third, you, don't, you are not a client, you enter the family. You create a family, you create a parish, you create not simply a clientele. And then people will be happy to pay the price. Well, thank you, Iran, for your engaging questions and uh, to you, Jean-Noël, for your very comprehensive responses. Now, before we conclude, now in just in two minutes, there's a special segment that I believe will be an immense value for all of us. I'm pleased to introduce you, Mr. Younes Eragi, our General Manager for Strategy and Development. Uh, Younes will offer a brief glance into the key programs and services that the business unit offer. Up to you, Younes. Hello, everyone. Hello. So, <laughs> first of all, uh, thank you to all of our attendees today and, today, and of course, a uh, big thank you to uh, it was a very uh, enlightening um, masterclass. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you with us in Seoul uh, a couple of months ago, and we're looking forward to the, to the next one. So we are the Luxury Business Group, uh, and we actually started as LBI, uh, Luxury Business Institute. Um, so we were delivering trainings. Uh, we saw that there was a need here on the Korean market to basically enhance the quality of service and the, the sales technique for luxury brands, but also for premium brands. And I will have the, the time to talk about it. And then um, the idea that we had was basically that if we were able to train um, the staff of our clients, we should be also able to identify the best talents to make sure that the sales and the quality of service reach a certain level. So we uh, decided to launch LBT uh, that basically handles all of our headhunting and recruiting activities. And then uh, quite naturally, uh, with um, our presence on the market, with the ties that we have in France, in Asia, in Europe, and of course here in, in Korea, we decided to launch LBP, Luxury Business Partners, uh, which is basically our consulting uh, division. So at uh, the Luxury Business Group today, we are quite proud to say that we can support our customers uh, with training services, with recruitment services, and with consulting services. And as you can understand, all of those um, different kind of services are, of course, um, linked, uh, and it gives us a wide range of services to support um, our different uh, customers. 
So today uh, we will focus uh, a little bit more on LBI, the Luxury Business uh, Institute. And I'll give you um, probably a, a better vision on the different kind of solutions that we have for the luxury sector, but also for the, the premium So in a nutshell, uh, and for your information, LBI has started around 15 years ago. So it's been quite some time here in Seoul. So we are headquartered here in Seoul. Uh, and uh, we are very happy and proud to say that we have supported around a hundred uh, different uh, clients. So of course, as our name indicates in the luxury sector, but also in what we call the premium sector uh, in different industries, such as hospitality, such as cosmetics, uh, such as automobile. Um, and we have supported them thanks to more than 60 uh, training modules that we have developed with the support and the very pre precious insight, sorry, from our over 170 experts, and I will take the time to speak about that uh, a bit later. And we are very proud to say that we have uh, delivered around 9,800 trainings, almost 10,000. And of course, we are looking forward to uh, the next uh, 10,000 trainings with our trusted partners. So uh, today, uh, and I will be very short, I would like to tell you how we basically unleash the power of uh, the different people that we hire and that we train. And uh, I'll, I'll show you a little bit how we put your customer at the heart of our training. And at the same time, how we support your staff uh, to basically elevate their sales performance to new heights. And this is basically what we do at the Luxury Business Institute. So here is a... Um, it's a summary, if, if I may say, of our different uh, uh, services that we deliver here at uh, the Luxury Business Institute. And if there is one thing that I would like to, to focus on is basically the, the, the fact that all of the training programs that we deliver are customized. We do believe in uh, the fact that if we uh, understand your value, if we understand um, your, your customers, your market, we have to basically come back to you with a customized training solution. And this is really at the core of everything that we do. But on top of regular, I would say, uh, in-class training, we are also uh, developing and we have developed several e-learning online solutions that are also training solutions. And we are able to uh, develop uh, new modules such as, for example, on-site uh, coaching that help us and help you to make sure that what we have delivered in our training classes and our, our training sessions are actually uh, put into practice in the store or uh, in your hotel, for example. And on top of that, uh, we are also able to, to handle what we call mystery shopping, where we basically uh, uh, deliver a full diagnosis of your store and the different services that you provide. Uh, so as you can see, we have a 360 degree a training solution that does not only include, I would say, um, traditional uh, training, but thanks to the different services that we provide, we're able to come with a customized um, solution to make sure that we, we help you uh, enhance your performances. And um, as a conclusion, so we always make sure that we customize our training programs. We do that thanks to the support of our experienced professional instructors and trainer. Uh, we make sure that on top of the training that we deliver, we go on site to make sure that everything is going well. And on top of that, we provide uh, combined services of recruitment and training. So we make sure that not only you have the best people, but those people are actually trained to go an extra mile in delivering uh, exceptional uh, quality of service. And finally, we also provide follow-up uh, training solutions to make sure that uh, the performance and the enhancement of your performance is continuous. And the last slide uh, that I would like to share with you uh, is in, in regards to our uh, pedagogy committee and the different experts that I mentioned before. So of course, we do focus on luxury, on retail and hospitality, but we have, uh, thanks to our experts, different areas of expertise such as architecture, art and culture, food and beverage, or sustain sustainability that is becoming more and more important uh, in, in different uh, industries. 
And thanks to our experts, we are able basically to continue, enhance and enrich our training programs and training solutions. And uh, just to name a few of our experts, of course, as you can see, Jean-Noël Capferrer, but I would also uh, like to mention Sylvie Pocheux and Catherine Lespin, who have been with us since the beginning of uh, the Luxury Business uh, Group, uh, or also uh, uh, Cormac uh, O'Keefe, that uh, is working on new solutions that can help us to develop, especially online and uh, e learning um, uh, programs. Recently, thanks to uh, Olivier Guillet, Albert Ben Soussan, or Alain Brière in their respective fields, we have been able to develop new programs in terms of leadership, hospitality, jewelry. So as you can see, thanks to our wide network of experts, we're able to innovate and also bring added value uh, through our training and consulting services. So once again, uh, thank you, uh, Jean-Noël Capferrer. Thank you all uh, for attending today and um, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to you, Younes. And uh, I would like to express to, to finish my uh, gratitude to every attendees today from uh, all over the world. And thanks to you, Jean-Noël. We had a, a great time and uh, I think we, we all learned uh, many things. Uh, so now Luxury Business Groups uh, looks forward to future collaborations with you, Jean-Noël, or experts or other, and new session in 2024 and uh, hopefully later. And uh, stay safe, stay curious. Thanks again, Jean-Noël, and until next time, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you.